Why do we care about robots? And don't we watch a lot of science fiction about robots and say, when are those robots really going to come and save the world? Well, you know, I call this movie, Big Hero 6, a robot documentary, because there's a lot of this that is real, that is really happening right now. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen a lot of research videos, a lot of legged robots getting kicked and falling down and things like that. And you wonder, but is that real? Am I going to see it in my house? Well, the robotics that you see here, soft robotics, is being commercialized right now. And it's being incorporated into a number of things, from robot arms that can strip paint off ships and work safely alongside people, to robot hands that are working in agriculture with fruit and with textiles, which are traditionally very difficult for stiff robots to work with. And these are very light, very cheap, and very safe for working alongside people. Now, this is some of the research coming out of Alison Okamura's lab in Stanford. And if you think it looks just like a balloon or a plastic bag, you're right. That's all it is. It's an inflatable plastic tube. And you say, but what good is that? Well, you can imagine in disaster scenarios, you can put this very light portable robot into any sort of situation. And it's capable of doing very strong things. And you can control and steer these robots, which seems really strange, but it's a matter of how you bend the surfaces on different sides. So they can be used to put out fires, to block pipes, and it's quite amazing to me the way that they can maneuver in really tight spaces. So that's talking about inflatable air robotics, but what about all those nanobots, those swarms of nanobots in Big Hero 6? Well, they were inspired by these micro-robots from SRI International. Now, they're not really nanorobots yet, they're micro-robots, they're smaller than one centimeter. But they're capable of working on flexible, curved surfaces, of working in zero gravity. And what they're doing right now is building carbon rod structures which are able to support a large amount of weight compared to the size. So they're going to be revolutionizing construction in ways that we can't even imagine yet. So I'm very excited about that. But you say, what about the robot apocalypse? What's going to happen if we're creating these fantastic robots? We're going to get these big, scary humanoids, and they're going to take over the world. Well, this is from the DARPA Robotics Challenge, which is the most advanced robotics competition in the world for humanoid robots. And it turns out that humanoid robots, they're not so good at things that people take for granted, like standing up or opening doors. And the big joke at the finals was, how do we prevent the robot apocalypse? We just keep the doors closed. So, <laughs> these are great robots, but they're not ready for commercial prime time yet. But having said that, one of the startups that I work with is a legged robot, and it's starting to be used commercially. And this is called Agility Robotics. The robot's called Cassie. It was modeled on an emu, and Cassie is going to be delivering parcels. And the bipedal structure means that it can travel over uneven terrain outside and climb up stairs. And it's becoming so affordable that it actually makes sense to use a robot to do some of these jobs. But here's another really unusual delivery robot. This is a solar-powered blimp. And at the moment, this is starting to be used for pipeline and power line inspection. And it's called the mothership because it deploys a whole lot of little drones. But here's the thing, this blimp is capable of carrying almost a whole supermarket. And then your packages can be delivered by air. And Amazon and Walmart have both patented something like this. But Mothership Aeronautics is a small one-person startup in Silicon Valley. And I think they're going to beat both Amazon and Walmart to the punch with drone delivery. 
And here's another startup doing e-commerce. This is Kindred.ai, and they're using robot arms to select the items that we get in things like, you know, I've got an Amazon addiction, so I'm always getting cart packages from Amazon. And these most common items are not just being picked up by the robot, but what they're doing is they're collecting data sets. They're generating the knowledge that will allow robots in the future to manipulate objects inside the home because they're exploring all of those objects for e-commerce. And another robotics startup, Bossanova Robotics, is also scanning everyday items, and they're doing it to do inventory in stores like Walmart's. Walmart's just announced that there will be 50 stores using robots to scan their inventory, and they will increase over the next year. Another set of robots that are doing both inventory and delivery, and also manipulation because they've got an arm, is a Silicon Valley startup called Fetch Robotics. And, you know, India's also got a startup that does logistics robots called Grey Orange Robotics. You may have seen the relay robot from Savio delivering things in hotels and delivering your drinks to the pool, but they're now rolling out in offices delivering parcels and letters. And Mayfield Robotics Kuri was at CES this year and is now being delivered to the first homes. And it can move around your house and play with you. And I think that might not seem like much, but in terms of smart robotics, to have a robot that can be in your home and move around and play with you, well, that's really quite significant. It's state of the art. But playing with you is not the only thing that these small social robots can do. Mabu from Catalia Health monitors your medication, and that's critically important for elder care and for difficult treatments like cancer treatments. And it's proven that a robot, social robot helping you is almost as successful as having 24-7 nursing care. It's not something that you get from an app. Robots have a far greater social relationship with people than an app on the screen of your phone. Why do we need robots? It's not just elder care. There are other major areas, agriculture, construction, mining, and logistics, where we simply do not have enough people anymore to do those jobs. Not only do we not have enough people, but those are also the most dangerous jobs in the world. Per capita, or per hundred workers, these are where the most fatalities happen in the workplace. In agriculture, it's things like cutting trees and getting caught in machinery. In mining, it's also getting caught in machinery and it's being crushed by rock falls and cave-ins. Transportation, it's accidents on the road. And in construction, you also get crushed and caught in heavy machinery and under collapsed structures. So maybe it's good for us to be thinking about robots that can help protect people from really dangerous work areas, but I think that the most pressing need we have for robots is agriculture. Why? Because we have to double the food production for the world in the next generation. Our population is increasing, but our population also demands better quality food. And our productivity is not changing. It's flat, and the amount of land that we have for agriculture is decreasing. We have less land because of the increasing urbanization as our population grows. So we have to do something to feed the world. And I do believe that robotics and smart technologies will be the future of that. Do you know right now, even on dairy farms, we have cows with smart RFID tags, and those cows can feed themselves, they can milk themselves, they can move freely around the farm, and they can text the farmer if they're feeling sick. That's pretty cool. And all the research shows that these are happy cows. It's a much less stressful life for them. It seems much more natural. And yet it's far more precise. All of the information is being tracked. And the farmer can look at it on the laptop instead of being out in the fields at 4 a.m. in the morning. So we have startups like Swarm Farm, which is producing a lot of smaller machines instead of the giant, expensive machines that we've started to develop on farms, particularly in the United States and Australia. 
And we have companies like Robotany that are doing urban farming. They're doing vertical farms in factories, in containers, and they're now rolling out in Whole Foods, producing really high quality fresh food 24 seven year round. So here's the challenge. For the US, the challenge is that there is already a large and expensive infrastructure in place on the giant farms, for example, and it's going to be very hard to shift over to smaller, cheaper, better robots. And maybe this is an opportunity for India, but you have smaller plots of land and you have a lot more labor. So you need to be smart and think about what sort of robots are going to be the best to revolutionize agriculture or other areas of life in India. And it might be something like this robot exoskeleton from Superflex. In fact, they say it's not an exoskeleton because it's all soft materials. They prefer to call it super underwear. And it turns you into a superhuman. And it protects your body from injury while allowing you to carry twice the weight and sometimes work twice as quick. And this has come out of army work on, on super suits for soldiers. It's being commercialized right now. So final thoughts, Norbert Wiener, the grandfather of robotics, cybernetics, and AI, back in 1964, said that the future is not going to be a comfortable hammock where robot slaves wait on us. Not at all. He said it's always going to be a human challenge. We need to create the robots, and then we need to solve the problems that might happen from with the robots. We need to create the future that we want. Thank you.